All right, all right, all right. Here we go, Sharkcast Pod. It is Victory Monday. Catching up with Kieran over coffee about Cronulla. My name is Sam Shinaz, you know G from 2015. The show is brought to you by Dyson Logistics, the Royal Media Yacht Club, Inport Hacking, and Jason Hawes at Crips and Crips Real Estate. And we are joined, as we are every Monday, by Mr. Kieran Fraser. It's been so long since I've seen you, I've forgotten what you look like. No, we we just, we were hanging out at the game and we had a good time. And Kieran, welcome to your Monday morning catch up over coffee. I've got a coffee. I didn't get a coffee today. I didn't have time. I thought I had time, but I didn't have time. I ran out just, of time. We'll just pretend. Yeah. Well, you, time is a man-made construct, so it doesn't actually exist. So you can never actually technically be late because there's no such thing as time. So that's a Kobe Bryant quote, but uh, I was never actually able to source that quote, so I don't know if it's real. It sounds real. It does. It does. But uh, that was one of the great nights at the football last night, um, seeing a lot of friends, ran into uh, Terry on the way out, saw Joshy there. Um that was just that was such a fun night of football, but geez, I was stressed at certain points, man. And you got me through it, so I appreciate you. <laughs> you you're okay. I, I mean, I can tell you're a bit stressed, but I mean, who wouldn't be watching that opening 25 minutes? Uh, let's, I, yeah, yeah. I keep it realist, Sam. And I just did not, I didn't, I didn't have the highest of hopes. And so to go down by 18, it was just, yeah, it was scary. Now, we should point out on Victory Monday, uh, we also have lives and we both have children close to us in close proximity so you may hear one or two or three of them but that's okay this is live podcasting video stuffing whatever we're doing so uh yeah great evening twilight game down at shark park full house uh always a lot of fun and i thought the atmosphere was actually a step up this week kieran it it definitely picked up that second half that first half was pretty grim um but the second half was definitely it was kind of pumping, and you could see that the the Sharks players were definitely fired up. And I think once that Trindle try was scored, you could kind of feel the whole building trying to change um, and really pick up. So yeah, no, it was that was a great night at football. I had so much fun. I was buzzing when I got home for a good hour or two. I watched the whole replay and I stayed up late, which is very hard for me. Yeah. So so Raiders, I wouldn't say they burst out of the sheds. Early, we just kept dropping the ball. We gave them a lot of ball, uh, particularly down our own end. And they scored tries in the 12th minute, the 18th minute, and the 24th minute. So going back in order, 24th minute, Danny Levi with what I call uh, NYC Toyota Cup try of the week, which is the dummy half barge over, which you should never allow. And we both had a little bit of a moment there because we could see it coming and the team didn't. And prior to that, we had Xavier Savage with uh, a really nice individual try, pretty bad read from Jesse Ramey. Not even a bad read, just a bad tackle. And then Nico in cover couldn't really help out. And the first try was to James Schiller. So down 18-0 after, well, up until the 28th minute, even at that point, I hadn't lost hope because Canberra were playing such a basic game of football. And we saw that in the second half. They just didn't have much to throw at us. Once we started lifting all over the park, particularly with the ball, we were on our way. And as soon as Trindle slammed that ball down, we kind of had a feeling they weren't going to go away. And uh, pretty, I guess, pretty proud of the effort. Like no one's going to claim the first 25 minutes being proud. But after that, 18-0 18-0 against anyone. It's hard to come back. It was it was a good effort. Yeah, there was three tries in nine minutes from the Sharkies. Um, and it, it kind of really changed when Hazleton came on the field and, and Tooks came on as well and, and Jack Williams. Uh, it was it's just a, a real momentum shift there. But, yeah, when they went down 18-0, there's only 15 minutes left in the first half. You're just kind of going, yeah, this is going to be one of those days, right? And mm. They're missing, what, 481 games in the middle of experience. And um, Kafusi looked busted on that first tackle. Old mate yeah. sitting behind us was absolutely giving it to poor Kafusi all game. I don't know what <laughs> Kafusi ever did to him. Um, yeah. But it just it just didn't feel like it was going to be one of those games. And then um, Blake started running more and, um, you know, it, 
that that snowball of momentum it was unreal and going at half time at all scores level you, you kind of like oh. yeah the sharks actually were playing good football and the raiders tries were just they were terrible to let in but they mm. weren't they didn't look spectacular as you were saying mate so yeah that, that was definitely feeling more confident at half time but even the first second half like the start of the second half the floodgates didn't open right away no, but we we did look better automatically. Uh, obviously, the the coach got up them at half time. But even if it was eighteen twelve at half time, I would have taken it and thought we're still going to go on with this. But yeah. eighteen all, it kind of just confirmed for me what was happening. And you know, it's such a simple game. You hold the ball, you win. They did that in the second half mostly. And yeah, there were some times when Canberra were offloading. It seems like be like their best thing to do is they offload the big guys, offload and. We contained that fairly well. There were moments where we didn't, but overall, I thought we got a hold of that, and and that was an improvement in the second half, especially. So you could see as the game went along, they were tinkering, getting it right. Uh, the attack came really good. Like there was some really fun tries. There was a, there was at least two bomb tries as well in the second half. Oh yeah, and, and there was just so many different opportunities where they kind of carved them up, and like that one with Atkinson when he went through, like if. If Ronaldo was just a second slower with that contact, or yeah, or that was so close on replay. Oh, like it would have been so good to see um, him get a try, Atkinson, because you know, like he came on and he did a real job for us in the middle too. And at, at one stage, I think Cam McInnes was playing front row, and Cam got through the full eighty. And I was looking at some of his stats, and like they were just off the charts. So you, you kind of love to see them kind of kick on and get those tries. But you know, even the Katoa try right on the bell, like they they just mm. kept fighting and they kept throwing things at the Raiders and. Um, it was just such a good night at Shark Park. Even seeing Mortimer, Terry, that didn't ruin it for me. Like, it was just such a great time. <laughs> I saw the tall man walking in and I, you know, I got no issues with, with Terry. And it, it was good. We had a little hug and caught up and saw his family. Uh, uh, is he misunderstood? I don't know. We've too much time already on Terry on the podcast. But uh, <laughs> let's go through the team, uh, Kieran, because we did a little pod with, Gary last night didn't really have time to get through the team, but let's go through the team, man, because they all played so well. Uh, I thought Will Kennedy actually wasn't one of his better games, but still did enough good things to impress me, particularly second half. Ran for over 100 metres. Uh, had one try assist. Fairly safe under the high ball. I think defensively in the first half caught out a little bit, but overall a strong enough game for me. Well, and that kick that he put in for that try for uh, yeah. was it? It was Ronnie, right? And I think it was like he was three meters out from the try line, and the angle that he did it was so tight, like that was just had to be absolutely perfect for that try. So that was probably one of the most impressive things for me. Um, we were talking before the game that maybe he was due for a try because he's been a little bit quiet on mm. that aspect of it, but um, mm. it's been a pretty solid season from Will. Um, it has, and again, like he did bounce back because. It, it, their confidence must have been rattled after that first half, like of the first half. Being down 18 after the week they had against the Tigers, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they kept playing football and they got themselves out of it. And I think Will was definitely one of those guys. And that kick for me was so impressive. Now, sitting where we sit, we have a nice aerial view. It's not particularly close to the action, but nice aerial view. And I mean, it's close when they're over our side of the field, but. I was watching the body language after the tries Canberra scored. And to be honest, from and I've got really bad eyes, as everyone know, but in all seriousness, the language didn't look good. It <laughs> didn't look like they were consoling each other and going, it's all going to be good. Da, da, da. Cam McInnes said the talk was fine. So, of course, we take that as the truth. And I'm not suggesting it wasn't, but the body language, because you look yeah. as a fan, you look to them and it didn't look good. There were some times where they were standing around and, and they – they just looked kind of lost uh, in that in goal. So I remember there was one after one of the tries and I think Nico was on the big screen and he just looked shattered. Um, yeah. And you're just going, oh no, is this, have we got scars from last week still? What's going to go on here? But um, they, yeah, they, they had that resiliency and that's what, when they go to that Trindle try and he put that ball down, he slammed that down like he was angry and it just really kind of set them off on that momentum and, and really sparked them. So, yeah, but to your point, when I was looking at them behind the goals, I was at times thinking, geez, this could be a long night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sione Katoa, another strong game, scored a try in the end, ran for over 100 metres, busted eight tackles, and 
Uh, a pretty good game from Sioni. You don't remember too much wrong with him. If we flip over to our other winger, Ronaldo Militalo, just under 100 run metres, two tries, and just very involved. And I really love 2024 Ronaldo. He's one of our best players out there. I mentioned it to you. I don't know if it's his haircut, but he looks younger. I, I can't understand why he looks younger, um, but he definitely does. And, you know, two line breaks as well from him. He was yeah, he was everywhere. And that break in the second half when um, they, they were running and Ronnie was just all over the place, him and Iro were on the floor when Katoa scored. They were exhausted. They were so tired from running around like they did. So I mean, Iro could have had a double. He could have had a double right there <laughs> yeah. and he kind of stiffed him. But, uh, yeah, obviously the lead-up was incredible. And well, and also Ronnie's um with the challenge too because we were down eighteen yeah. nil at that point, right? So if if, that, if he didn't get that challenge right, yeah, um, you know who knows? Maybe the Raiders kick out to twenty four. You know, I think I think one more try is probably too much psychologically. Like obviously, it wasn't enough. Like they could have scored as we saw thirty six points, but psychologically, it might have been too much that one more try. So I'm glad that that happened. Uh, Jesse Ramian had an unhappy start to the game defensively in an error or two, but he flipped it around and he was one of our best players out there. I keep saying that they they were all pretty good. Uh, Jesse Ramian ran for 160 meters and three offloads, very involved in the game as well, which we needed these guys at the back just to be heavily involved. They were, and I think he's going to get better. I, I really do. I think that offload um, for Sifo that was put down early in the game and that defensive um, read off the scrum, like it, it was, it wasn't the best start for Jesse. And I think it was just a lot of him trying so hard because he he really cares and he was really putting in. And those stats, hundred and sixty meters, three offloads, he was really ripping in. And again, I, I've said this a few times, but the bounce back and the mental resilience that they've showed there from Jesse, especially after that unhappy start. You know, that was pretty special. Mate, my voice is absolutely gone from screaming last night. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was sitting next to you. You weren't too bad. We had some good fun, though, in those tries. Uh, oh. Second game for the Sharks, Cal Iro had a terrific game. Uh, scored his first NRL try. Ran for 130 metres, busted eight tackles. Uh, made 10 with no misses. And I thought, although he was involved in that first try that Canberra scored. But anyway. A really strong game from Caliero. I, I was super impressed with him. Really good attitude. Looks calm out there. And not much more I could have done. The double pump for Ronnie's try um, for a guy in his second game um, to get us mm. to down by oh, six. Oh, incredible. incredible. That was so much class for, for a guy in his second game. And he's been so patient uh, at this club. And, um, you know, he's yeah, got I, been, I left he's out, been I left out try assist. Sorry, I left out try assist. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's it's interesting because when he played that game last time, was that 2022, was it? Yeah. Yeah, it was a pretty unhappy start from memory. But um, I think, was he, did we have him on the wing in that game? On the wing, unhappy first game, pretty good second half. Uh, sorry, unhappy yeah. first half, yeah. Yeah, so he did the bounce back. But again, this time he was actually playing in his preferred position and he just looked like an NRL player. Um, so obviously that does create some headaches um, because, again, you've got Nakora coming back, so Sifa will probably go back to that position. But again, he's our 18th man for most of this season, it looks like. So again, he's always going to be ready to go and already ready to be called upon if they need him. So it's great to have that sort of depth in the squad. It's just... How much longer can we keep him around? Yeah, and I'm not convinced either way of where he's going to be next game. I'm not convinced he won't play. I'm obviously not convinced he will play. And the coach was asked about it in the press conference. He sort of made a joke and went, give me some time just to evaluate the win, have some fun during the week with the bye. But uh, it was a good enough performance where you go, maybe he's not going straight back. Because if the coach and coaches see – a benefit with him being there and Talakai being elsewhere. Maybe they run with it. So let's see how it plays out. Not suggesting he's sticking there, but I don't think it's an automatic go back to New South Wales Cup or wherever. I I really don't after that performance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Harv's terrific. Braden Trindle, 
we probably won't speak enough about him and how good he was because Nico was also really, really, really good. But on Trindle, he scored the try that got us back in the hunt. I uh, thought he kicked really well and had try assist and just very safe and secure out there. He was a little quiet and then he put his foot down for that try and then it was game on for Trindle. And I thought he played a nice combination with Nico as in he stepped up when Nico was on the other side of the field or doing whatever, really happy with the way they're gelling. It's only nine or 10 games in as a duo. so a long way to go. And I thought Nico was terrific. His kicking game was awesome. He wasn't in one of those moods where he has to do everything all at once. It was yeah. tempered and kicking game, as I said, exceptional R- running the big camera forwards back and forth, up and down the field. Great game play. And really nice with the ball too. A lot more running from him. He ran for almost 100 meters and he looked good in passing and overall super happy with him and for him. But his running game was, it was relentless. And, you know, even with a minute or two left, he was still taking the line on, which was kind of stressing me because I just wanted to get yes. out of there with no injuries, right? Yes. But um, he's, his running game, his kicking game, his goal kicking as well was unbelievable. Yeah. What about that... Uh, the second goal that he kicked where it looked absolutely butchered. Even the lady behind us was spraying him and then the flags went up. So I have no idea how he pulled that kick off. That was an unreal yeah. kick. Um, and it's but, important to, to mention the goal kicking because because yeah. down 18-0, you got to go six points at a time. Otherwise, it's just a bigger hill to climb. And they weren't easy kicks. They were all kicks nah. that were out wide and they were hard. But um, the, the most impressive thing to me was – the control that Nico showed and the kicking game. And he kept pinning them back into their own 10, 15 meters, putting it into touch, you know, just saying, all right, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves here and, you know, put it deep and and kick it out and just forcing the Raiders because the Raiders had so many errors in their game. And and the guys Mm. who historically cause us problems, like the Horsburghs of the world, like he, I think he had two drops. I think uh, Smithers, what's his name? The 13 there for the Raiders. Smithy, yeah, he had two drops. I think Savage had two drops. Like the Raiders dropped a lot of ball. And again, if you were patient and you were willing to go set for set with them, they they were giving us those errors. And Nico's kicking game, you know, didn't let them off the hook. And, and that was really great to see. Hmm. Now, forward pack did a great job given it was a bit makeshift. Uh, Tall Tom Hazleton started the game, played 50 minutes, ran for 100 meters, 32 tackles. He looked just fantastic with the ball, hard to stop, and super happy for him just to be anywhere in that 17. I don't care whether he starts off the bench. Fantastic. Uh, Oregon Kafusi had an injury in the first tackle, and his number is a little bit skewed by that, but he did end up playing 35 minutes, ran for about 70 meters, uh, 21 tackles. And we'll, we'll stick with the middles. Cam McInnes... Unbelievable. Unreal. I, I didn't realize till Gary told me he played the whole game. Yeah. Uh, afterwards, Gary told me he played the whole game, ran for 150 meters, made 48 tackles, missed one, and just really shoring up that middle both in attack and defense. And I, I thought it was just a superb effort from him. I, I'm glad he's getting two weeks off. <laughs> and some of the balls that he caught were like bad passes or they were, they were just behind him or just in front. And there were so many times where it looked like he was going to drop the ball, but yeah. he just held on to it and just kept going. And he, I saw a little bit from Fitz like that, that credited him for the turnaround and just sort of saying that when you've got a guy like Cam McInnes who's going like he does, it just forces everyone else to lift. And yeah, that second half, I'm 99% sure he was playing in the front row, which for a guy of his size is just yeah. absolutely insane. And to bust out those meters and do the 48 tackles, did you say? Like yeah. That's insanity, mate. And the yeah. whole 80 minutes, like, and that was a performance. You probably could have given him a rest um, given the way that yeah. the game goes. So I think we finished the game with an extra interchange we didn't use. So <laughs> he obviously wanted to stay out there and, and prove a point, but. Yeah, he's a guy. When we first signed him, I, I didn't think he he was on, he wasn't on my radar. He wasn't someone yeah. I thought would be a good fit for us because you know we had Blake Braley. And then once I started thinking about him in the thirteen role, I wasn't sure because of the size. 
But um, in terms of value for money, like he he doesn't take a week off. He's just he's insane. He he must not be all there to because to be his size and to play he, how he does, I just don't know how he does it. And I think it's a good sign for anyone who's doubting the coach because over summer, coach had a chance to put Dale Fanuk in there, starting lock. Uh-uh. Cam McKinnon showed enough last year. That's his job. So It's his, it's and they, his jersey. They, they, yeah. might, they might share it when Fanukin's back, of, with all respect. But point is, Cam's not a benchy anymore. So yeah. coach saw that. Coach made some changes. Well, he's also now 18 months or so, two years back from that ACL injury that he had, right? So, you know, maybe that was the plan was to ease him back that first year in 2022. And then last year was kind of, you know, working out how does he fit with Dale? Um, because there were some times where it didn't really work. But yeah. um, having him in that role for us now, and as a starter, you know, he, he can't go back to the bench. There's no way you could put Fanukin in my mind over him no. in that role. We saw in number 14, Dan Atkinson come on and he played about 10 minutes, which is the most he's actually played in the NRL. And he was playing as a roving lock middle. Uh, he ran for about 30 meters, pretty important meters, made seven tackles. And he impressed the hell out of me just for his courage and his commitment to the cause. Cause we weren't really sure how he was going to play. We know in the middle he could sort of play a hooker kind of role. But he was just doing hit-ups like everyone else as if he was three times the size. And, I mean, if you if you watch the game back, and I'm not saying it's because of him, but Canberra did get back into that game with that try, and they brought Jack Williams back onto the field. So he was replacing Jack Williams. They brought him back on just to shore it up, but it wasn't a slight on Atkinson. Atkinson did a role, and he was really, really good. I thought uh, Billy Burns had a important role as well like he came on for 30 minutes his stats are not amazing but you watch him off the ball and particularly watch his 14 tackles no misses he's a bigger boy than we gave him credit for and you watch him kieran uh stop the offload that was yes. his number one defensive role was almost second third man in but he had these big arms and and i just noticed that on the replay i was like wow look at him go he's really stopping that offload and he was he was really physical, and he also did a lot of the hit ups that you know it's that first hat, like first off the of the set hit up that no one really wants to take. He did a yep. lot of the tough stuff, and that really impressed me because, again, he's in a limited role. He probably knows that he's not going to get a lot of games um, given the guys that are in front of him, but um, he really stepped up and delivered. And I think having him on that bench kind of gave us that stability because when we spoke last week, it was kind of like the issue wasn't the one to thirteen; it was how do we fill up a bench because we didn't have enough players really available. But he and Atkins just, they really stood up and did a job job for us. But um, Jack Williams though, my goodness. Well, what, just, have you heard anything on, around his on, contract status then? I haven't, but I, I do want to start a GoFundMe for him. But you've, you're throwing <laughs> the, you're throwing, this is your inexperience of podcasting, Kieran. you're throwing the storyline out. Because first we've got to get to Tuku Hatapua. I thought we were going for, in number order. No, we're just going in whatever order I didn't tell you about, to be fair. Uh, <laughs> we're going with Big Tooks, 20 minutes, uh, 90 metres of runs, nine nine tackles, no misses. Uh, one error, I don't know how it happened. They put him on his back somehow and <laughs> the ball popped out. But it's never happened before. A terrific effort from him, 20 minutes, uh, which is twice as long as his last stint. And uh, to be fair, by the 20 minutes he was done, he looked pretty gassed. But a terrific addition to the 17, and I thought he played a role too, right Right when we needed someone to come on and cause a bit of damage. He definitely did. And they used him a little bit more out wide too. Like he was yeah. running off Nico a little bit out wide. And um, I think the impressive thing for me, I missed it because I was getting back to my seat, but that first set uh, after half time when I watched the replay, he had two hit-ups in that first set. Like it, it, it seems like he's got a opportunity and he knows that um, he's worked really hard for it and he's earned it. And that interview that he did with you, he kind of spoke about, he felt like when he got the opportunity last time, it was kind of yeah. because of injuries and things like that. Whereas he now feels like this is his chance to actually make an impact. And he, yeah, he doesn't leave a stone unturned. Like he's very busy for a man of his size, but yeah, he is the biggest human I've ever seen. For someone that young to have that 
awareness as well of why he was playing for the Roosters and then being okay <laughs> with it and then turning it into a positive, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and most young guys that are that size, then they come through the ranks, they're like the best player in their age group or the, the team that oh, they sure. play in, right? So they've all got those inflated egos and heads. And for him to have that self-awareness, as you said, it just really speaks well to the character. And that's why, you know, I saw some people that were surprised that we re-signed him for this season, given that he didn't play NRL last season. No. But, you know, Fitz has been with this guy now for a number of years before he came to the Sharks, right? So he obviously knew what he had there and, um, you know, we haven't signed many players from the Roosters. I think he's him and Ikevalu have been it, but um, he has been a tremendous pickup for us. And again, it just gets me excited about the depth that we're building for next season as well. But you know, still a long way to go this year. Yeah. So walking out, I saw Royce Hunt had a quick chat with him, and he reckons he's back. I think he said after the buy. I'm pretty sure he said that. If not, it's very close. So there are a bunch of middles coming back, but a fellow like. A fellow like Tuku has done enough to really put an, at least an idea in the coach's head. Well, maybe it's not an instant you get back to play for the Jets. Maybe you do stick around. We'll see how it plays out. Could you imagine uh, the size of that bench having Hazelton, Hunt, Tuku on there? Like Fun. A lot of fun. Oof. So we talked about it. Jack Williams, uh, 46 minutes. I would imagine man of the match. Ran for yeah. 170 meters, 27 tackles. Just phenomenal. The way he ran the ball just changed the game. Off the bench, a couple of stints, was relentless. Uh, came from Canberra, maybe had an extra drive to play good against them, but I think overall just, just doing it for the team. He's, in theory, playing for a contract. I'm sure he's pretty... I'm sure he's in the man. <laughs> well, I'm, he's secure at night knowing that someone's going to pick him up, but I think... The point is he wants to stay, and, and I'm sure they want him to stay. So it's just a matter of working it out. But uh, phenomenal, game-changing performance, much like the Warriors game. Yeah, and I think back to last week, right? And last week, because, again, we were down on troops, the logical thing was give Jack a start because he's been so good in the weeks before it, right? But he was out on an edge, and I think he made 55 metres like last week versus the Tigers. He goes back to that more familiar role in the middle, coming off the bench and yeah, he changed the game when he came on and that's not the first time that he's done that this season. And the progression of Jack Williams since he first came into first grade to now it's, it's amazing. And, and some players really like when you first start watching them and you might not be a fan of them and you might not understand what the coach sees in them. You definitely see that now with Jack Williams. Like he has transformed his game completely around. He's unrecognizable to the guy when he first came into first grade now and, you know, he's got 100 games now on the books. Yeah, he's been at the Sharks since, what, 2018 or so? Yeah. He's been here for a long that's time. Right. You know, he was a guy before that I wouldn't have cared if we lost. I would have just said, yeah, look, that's the cost of doing business as we developing our 17. But he is a must keep for us now because the punch that he gives us off the bench, it's just ridiculous. Um, you know, he's quickly rocking up the charts and becoming one of my favourite players. And it's kind of like that 2016 season with Bakuya. Because when Bakuya would come on, he would just have those runs and, and change the game with that momentum. And Jack Williams can give you that. So I'm a huge Jack Williams fan. And I, that's a sentence I didn't think I'd say probably four or five years ago. Yeah, absolutely terrific. And the last gentleman we're going to talk about is the hooker, Blake Braley. And I think last night, if you weren't sitting comfortably under a nice umbrella on Blake Island, at least for last night, maybe you were, maybe he turned you around a little bit. He ran for 40 meters, which for him is a lot. Uh, he kind of set up his own try. He doesn't get the yeah. assist, but he set up his own try with it, with a kick and a chase and a very strong performance engaging the line to so take you got to add meters to the 40 meters officially there's a lot of line engagements which we're not giving you meters for yeah and no, really no. pressuring the referee for penalties sometimes it works sometimes it didn't he was a lot more vocal even when he wasn't getting the penalties he was doing the old you know ennis arm gestures and that kind of stuff and he had a very involved game and yeah i thought i thought he was one of our best and again, he did that without 481 games of NRL experience around him in mm. the middle, right? He mm. had to step up for us. And um, 
he really did. That that try that he scored uh, was was unreal. But the most impressive thing for me was the line engagements because he was really getting out and making the Raiders work, um, you know, for yeah. around marker and yeah. just really dragging those forwards onto the ball. And, and that made McInnes look unreal and some of the other guys as well in the middle because that was the real concern for this game was the middle was how can we handle that veteran Raiders pack and full transparency. I actually tipped the Raiders this week and, you know, I don't often tip against the Sharkies. What but are you doing? I just didn't see it. I just I thought that our middle was not going to have enough to go with those veterans. And Blake Braley did a great job of exploiting those old legs. And, um, you know, he absolutely took them down. It, it was a really – that's probably one of the best Blake Braley games I've actually seen. Yeah, uh, I didn't see anything wrong with it. And very, very influential in that win, I thought, you know, along with Jack Williams. Yeah. Some other guys starred in a team that did really well, but uh, Blake was one of our best. We need to mention the second rowers. Uh, both kind of understated in their performances, but still really strong games. Teague Wilton did what he did. Very solid. 29 tackles, almost 70 metres. Very physical from him. The one that will shock you a little bit is, well, not shock you, but Talakai ran for about 30 metres. but Really? Yeah, but he played 53 minutes. He made 14 tackles. Don't forget, he's probably also engaging the line a lot in those sweet yeah. plays and that kind of stuff. So you could add a few more there unofficially. But well, that shows you, a, a it shows you a different – he had a rest, but it shows you a different role they can use him with and still win the game comfortably. Yeah, and so Nakora goes back to that position – then it becomes where do you put Sifa and where do you put Iro and how do you come up with that balance there? Because, yeah, yeah Iro definitely showed something. We know, like, Sifa has been in our top three players most games this whole season, right? That was probably the, the quietest game. Uh, but, again, Jack Williams had a quiet game in that same role the week before, right? So yeah. is it we're so used to Nakora in that role and it, it probably speaks a lot of volumes around what, what he actually brings to us as well. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of NRL players there, but it's working at how to put the right pieces in the right places um, that is really you know going to determine where we finish this season because there's there's a lot of good players there, but it, it's just finding out what is the best seventeen because you're going to bring back Fanukin, you're going to bring back Royce Hunt, you're going to bring back Hamlin Ueli, you eventually you're going to get Toby back, right? So some of these guys that are performing now are going to not make it, right? So there's going to be some tough decisions in the next few weeks, which is a great position to be because we could barely feel the 17 this week. I don't want to sound like more of a weirdo than I am, and I'm his biggest fan. But is there a chance Royce doesn't come straight back in? Yeah. Well, it, it, it seems to me as, you know, the average punter watching the game, he gets hooked more than any of the other middles. It seems like he will push like a pass or something like that, and then you'll find him off the field pretty quickly after it. So I don't know if that's a learning curve thing or if that's a you know an in-house thing, or maybe I'm just you know making that up in my head. But um, yeah, maybe that. But I, I actually think Kafusi's busted because he was really taped up around his thighs, and I went back and I watched that first tackle maybe three or four times. Mm. And um, he was in agony. It was mm. he was on the ground for that whole set of six. Like I thought he was gone. I didn't think he was going to be able to get up. I don't know how he was able to shake it off. But he was his thigh was heavily taped up. So maybe Kafusi gets a spell um, to rest up because he had a big workload this first uh, month or so of the competition. And I again, get the I get the feeling if we weren't short all those people last night, he may not have come back on or he would have come off at least when he didn't yeah so. there was so much padding around that leg and mm. yeah you know, he's a guy that's off contract as well with that mutual option that um you know the club has to make that decision on and he's got to make that decision as well uh, with the way mutual options work so tough call for the sharks yeah it is it is because it, you've you've unearthed uh tooks who's um talks sorry uh, for Nico, for when he's listening, um, who's obviously now on contract. Hazleton's on contract. Uh, Hunt's on contract. You're bringing in Fenua Blake. You've got Williams, who you want to keep. It, that's a balancing act. But I just I don't see Fitzgibbon bringing a guy to the club 
um, and then walking away from him after two seasons without there being something historically or catastrophic going and, wrong and with there, that signing. It hasn't, and hasn't, there hasn't been. No, he's been solid. Okay, he hasn't been amazing. He hasn't been lights out. But A, we've seen an improvement this year, and B, last year wasn't a disaster at all. Like, I wouldn't blame him for a lot of what went wrong. So, uh, probably you need to look at your middle depth chart then see, you know, what he's on and then how much he's going to play if everyone's fit and then you kind of work backwards from there. But I, I, I don't think it's an easy call for the club. It's a tough one. It's a real tough one. And, and you kind of say, well, where else could we spend the money? You know, how many middles do we actually have? And, you know, it's it's ironic that we're having this conversation because last week we had four injuries and, you know, we don't have enough to really cover and fill the team, right? So there is a, there's obviously a magic number there. But, again, I look at those guys down to Tooks, who's probably at the bottom of that depth chart, um, and I say, look, a lot of these guys would be in NRL 17s in other clubs, Right. And so we do sacrifice the depth in other positions, um, like the back row, which, you know, we we are skinny in. Um, so, you know, maybe that's a Fitzgibbon thing where he's got a, a, a magic mm. number in his mind of middles that you need uh, to win mm. a competition. So, yeah, that's a tough call. But, I mean, a, a Tooks, for example, if he's playing at West Tigers week in, week out at the moment, or whoever, Canterbury, one of the lower teams – maybe that's not the best way to go for his career either. Like this is probably the better preferred option. Absolutely. And, and yeah. I think that's the case with Eero as well, right? You know, if he was at one of those lower teams, you know, he could be a scapegoat, right? He could have, you know, been in that Nofaluma role where, yeah. you know, every try they get scored down his edge, you know, the fan base turns on him and, you know, 18 months later he's off in, you know, the Super League, right? So I think yeah. that's the value of, the, the, the salary cap raises it's allowed clubs that are developing players to keep their depth. You know, we were having a discussion with uh, the young fellas last night. Uh, I think it's Ryan and Daniel from out Parramatta way. Sorry if I've got your yeah. name wrong guys. Um, You've only sat next to them for 14 years, but you know. <laughs> yeah, that's terrible. That Sorry guys. Follow me on social media so I can actually remember what your names are. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's um, even worse, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a big week. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll apologize on behalf of Sharkcast for that comment. But they, um, we were having that discussion, right? We've got guys like Stone Street that uh, are buying their time. And historically, you wouldn't have been able to keep them at your club because they would have got money to go elsewhere and, and taken that opportunity. But with the way the salary cap is rising and the minimum salaries, you're, you're getting a chance to keep those guys at your club for a little yeah. bit longer and, and working out how to actually put those pieces together to build that best squad. So it, it, that's actually another thing that we haven't touched on is that, um, you know, Eero getting that tackle on Fogarty um, in the last 17 minutes of the game on the last tackle. Um, yeah. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, but fifth tackle right in front of us, Ronaldo with the kick pressure. Yep. And then that led to Eero making the tackle, both exceptionally great work. Yeah. And so that was for us, the score then was 24 18, and we scored the next set to go up yeah. by 12, right? So, you know, Ronnie chasing you out of there, but then Eero having that, you know, he's 24 now. He's had, you know, a ridiculous amount of games in New South Wales Cup. He's got that experience now. He hasn't been rushed. And no. this, he was like a, he, he played like a guy that had a lot more experience. And I think that's kind of going to be what you're going to see from these guys who are applying their trade in New South Wales Cup a little bit longer. Uh, versus coming straight out of the 20s, like, you know, five, six years ago, what we would see, like when Ronaldo made his debut, for example, right? Yeah. He was plucked straight out of the 20s, and, and that Broncos game was was probably one of the harder debuts I've, I've watched. And, you know, full credit to Ronnie for bouncing back from that. Like, yeah. know, he's quickly become one of the great wingers that we've had at this club. So, yeah, it's exciting. So with Eero, the other good thing was that he'd waited so long for his second chance, and he absolutely came out, of the blocks quick, like he did nothing wrong. His hit ups were great. Every hit up was sort of 10 meters, if not more. And he looked really strong from the start. Even when they were down 18 nil, you look at him going, oh, he's, he's hitting up pretty good and like he looks good. So he took charge. He waited so long, took charge of the situation and impressed everyone. And I think that was what we were looking for in the trials. But in hindsight, A, the trials are just a waste of time. B, you're playing park football almost. Yeah. So you can't – but, you know, when the – when the, as the macho man says, the cream rises to the top, 
so did he. And that stood out to me. And it's like, well, why was I expecting this guy to light up a trial match? Who, who cares? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And in the trials, like there's so many different players out of position and, yeah. and the guys aren't going at 100% full speed. And nah. you, you're wanting guys to step up and, and stake a claim. But at the same time, like the, even the opposition, like it's just a weird, it's a weird concoction. And I don't know how you ever get that perfect balance with trials. Um, they're a necessary evil, um, but I love watching them. And I love now that Fox actually shows them because that was such a black hole for a while. And it makes this season go a little bit longer. So I like that. Um, but yeah, he was you know, tremendous. You know, we're starting to sound like another podcast over here, just rapping Euro so much, but uh, that's, that's okay. okay. Now, tell us about your Korean chicken and chips you got yesterday. Uh, so I went to Birdman, um, which is one of the food trucks uh, at, at the venue. So I, I saw that at the Easter show and I, and I, I don't know why, but I was like, Birdman, I've heard well, that. Well, yeah, let's, good. let's back up. So yesterday you had a big day. You, for some reason, went to the Easter show on Easter Sunday, and then you backed up for the footy. So you're the man of the match, really. <laughs> that was that was a really tough, tough uh, innings for me, going to the Easter show on Easter Sunday without having pre-booked car parking. Um, uh, so, I, I didn't even ask. I assumed you did. No, so I didn't pre-book parking. And uh, I was going to take the bus. I was going to drive to my mother-in-law's and, and, and take the bus from there. Uh, she lives out Roseland Ways. But um, the reality of taking the bus it, it struck me in the face after, you know, the reality of going and doing the Easter show all day, having show bags and trying to get the kid on, on the bus. And you've probably heard one of my daughters screaming her head off this morning. They're just absolutely feral at the moment. Um, bit of sickness in the house. So we pulled the pin on that. We just drove out there. And as you're driving into Homebush, there's signs everywhere on these billboards saying there is no parking. Do not drive. <laughs> They're lying to you, Sam. You can get a car spot there. Um, oh. Not in the p1s and, and things like that but there are some other areas that you can get spots into so don't listen to them don't use public transport drive create chaos <laughs> um but oh, look, I'm not gonna, show... I'm, I'm, i don't want to touch that one but also i don't want to be a podcast that makes grand headlines so we might just <laughs> we're not going to edit that none of this is being edited but if you want to use public transport use it you and i are kind of off it at the moment but someone else you know everyone lives their own life <laughs> Continue. I was just measuring that now in, in the paper. Shark cast causes traffic chaos. Um, <laughs> and a picture of my mug up there. Um, but I, the one thing that hit me was how expensive the Easter show was, right? And this is the first time that I've yeah. ventured out there with kids. And, um, you know, I got a, a coffee there. And uh, I got an iced coffee because I don't trust um, those vendors to be a good coffee. So I got an iced coffee. It was $11.50 for an iced coffee. It was $6 yeah. for a bottle of water. That's um, ridiculous. I got a a, a, a Pluto pup uh, there after we had one at the football the week That's, before. Uh, two in two weeks, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's becoming a new thing. That was $15. <laughs> um, I could not believe the price of, of, of these things. Um, yes. Yeah, and not I'm not even starting on the show bags. I mean, the show bags, bro, were, they're like $30 a show bag these days. It's, yeah. I, look, you know, if they need to charge those prices because they you know they need to make money, I get it. But there's definitely some gouging going on when it's eleven dollars yeah. fifty for a coffee. Yeah, yeah. It's I guess it's like a lot of those events, especially out in that suburb. You know, they oh. they tend to just get you six dollars uh, for a water. How, what were we talking about before this? Korean this show, Korean barbecue. Korean, chicken. Yeah, tell me about the Korean barbecue chicken. So I got that. I got the uh, the popcorn chicken, which had some sticky uh, red sauce, they called it. So I had no idea what that was. It was kind of like a sweet and sour uh, and mm. chips. Mm. That, that was reasonably priced. I think that was like $15. So it wasn't too bad, especially considering the assault that I'd copped earlier in the day at the Easter show. Um, it was really good. That was the first time I've actually gone to one of the food trucks besides the uh, Bratwurst, uh, uh -huh. the guy that, that does them. Uh, and I was really impressed with it. And because it was during the 20s game, um, and if anyone wants to know how the 20s went, they did not go well. No. Um, it got me through the 20s game. But, um, yeah, it was just a little bit much. I felt a little bit sick. I couldn't really finish it. But um, I'm a big fan of the food trucks, and uh, I want to go check out maybe the Zambrero one next time. Yeah, absolutely. We'll take our um, our membership cards, get our 10% off. But uh, yeah, the experience was pretty good for us yesterday that we, we had some drinks beforehand. It was nice in the ET members bar area, which is a good touch. And yeah, overall, a really good fun day for us. And we got the two points, which is the most important thing. Now we have entered the week that is 
Well, for me personally, and maybe a bit less for you, but still, I know historically speaking, an important week in your life. We are in WrestleMania week, officially. Oh, yeah. So next Sunday is night one, because, you know, if you haven't heard, it's 2024, and for a few years now, it's over two nights. Like it, hate it, however you feel, we're doing two nights. Next Sunday and Monday, Australian time. And you did just send me a funny thing on Seinfeld wrestle posting of The Rock holding up uh, his belt saying "Moops." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, big week. You know, you've got Hall of Fame, you've got NXT pay per view, you've got Last SmackDown, First Raw, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's a big week, and and I am excited. It's going to be intriguing to see how it plays out, particularly the big storyline. Yeah, so I have not really been a WWE guy for a while. Um, I, I like AEW, uh, which is a little bit more, um, reminds me a bit more of ECW, where it's a little bit more violent, a little bit more chaotic, a little bit more uh, edgy. Um, but since they've brought back The Rock, uh, he has been unbelievable to watch. And and it's something that it's can't miss TV when he's on the TV and he's swearing and, you know, he's kicking the crap out of Cody Rhodes and, you know, he's covering the blood on the belt. Like it's, it's actually, it's the most excited I've been for a WrestleMania probably in 20 years. Um, because for me, uh, the WWE just got a little bit stale for me and, you know, it was very kitty and I wasn't really enjoying it, but um, you know, they've got punk now and, it's looking like when they go to Netflix, there's even talk where it won't be uh, like censored as much. Yeah. Um, where it's going to be pretty pretty out there because they've got that security with Netflix. They can kind of do what they want. So having that sort of edginess to it has been unreal. So I'm really looking forward to WrestleMania. And that's a sentence I didn't think I would say up there with Jack Williams being one of my favorite players. <laughs> um, so The Rock, The Rock is a bad guy. He's probably one of the most exciting things I've seen in, in that space in such a long time. He does it well. He does it really well. And yeah, you know, there's so many, I think the, the strength obviously is there's so many characters at the moment. You got the Cody thing, you got Seth, even old mate Drew stepped up punks on the mic. Like it's really intriguing stuff. And I think also if I look at my calendar today, today, Kieran. So this week, I think maybe Thursday, Friday, our time, you better jump on to any available content provider you can uh, find, Kieran, and the Bray Wyatt documentary will be out this week. Ah, that's going to be amazing. I, I saw some of the, like, clips on that. Oh, and, um, dude. Oh. And I know you're it a big looks, Bray guy. You're sure that big, you've got his Unreal about your Bray shirt too, by the I'm way. A, I'm, I'm a big Bray guy. And and the the the, uh, the preview, the the... The short, the trailer, I don't know, whatever you call it. And that, that already gets you. The way they've done it, it looks like they've really gone about it the right way. The brother's heavily involved. And I I dare say there'll be some tears shared watching that, Docco. Yeah. And so if anyone doesn't know who Bray is, yeah, he passed away in his mid-30s uh, very unexpectedly. Um, had some health battles. Um, super sad. And uh, he was really in the prime of his career. He's one of the biggest stars that they had. So it's, um, yeah, it's going to be a pretty emotional watch. But uh, mate, wrestling is, is awesome again. And it is a sentence, again, I did not think I would say. So if you haven't watched wrestling in a long time, I, I suggest you check it out because it's like the late 90s, which was some really fun times to watch wrestling. Now, I won't necessarily be watching live. So if you send me something on social media about the sharks and it's in that kind of ballpark and thankfully we've got the week off i probably won't respond for 12 to 24 hours because i'll be catching up and thanks to Southo dan i cannot go on social media because if i block all these things block all these words which i've done dan just goes I can't believe the Macho Man's alive and came off a top turnbuckle and wins the belt. You know, it's like, thanks a lot, See, the man. key there is just blocking Dan. I think that's the key. Yeah. yeah, but then he'll send me something like, you know, I saw Eero up the street and gave him a kiss and here's a photo and I have to see it and it, I won't but see it. But he's also know, the so. type of guy that would just appear at your house too and be like, hey, uh, I noticed that you've blocked me. So <laughs> shout out to Southern Dan. But I think that's happened before. <laughs> that's actually yeah. how i met him we, <laughs> we give him a shout out for sure and uh 
yeah, it's going to be a fun week. Sharks got the week off, so that's a positive in a lot of ways. I know we'll miss watching them play, but it's a long year, and it's been a roller coaster over four games already. It feels a bit longer, to be honest. But and you know what? Nil down. Wow. Three. We're three and one. Obviously, should be four and zero, but we're three and one. It was really looking like it was going to be two and two heading into the bye, and that would have yeah. been really deflating. Um, yeah. You know, with that start that they had, I was sitting there going. How did this season start so promising after that Warriors game? And then we go into that first by two and two. And then, again, we've got the Raiders in like three or four weeks um, to play yeah. again. So, yeah, so happy that they turned it around. Uh, the buy could have come at a better time. You know, get some players back, get Nakora yeah, yeah. back at least. It's going to be we, a difference. We're going to need him because I don't want to like – I don't want to temper this. I don't want to bring everyone down, but we beat – the Warriors away, who are fantastic, so good job. We beat the Bulldogs, who aren't that great. We lost to the West Tigers, who aren't that great. We beat the Raiders, who aren't that great. So only reason I say that is Warriors game, Raiders game, unbelievable circumstances. Great, yeah. like, great wins. Memorable wins. Wins we'll be talking about in 10 years' time. But when you look at the draw ahead... It gets more difficult. Now, we are getting troops back. But I, the thing I like about that, Kieran, is we can work our way into it. We yeah. can ease our way into it. We've had a tough run. We've come through mostly with line colours. And then it's time to go. That South game, the first game back after the bye, is going to be a really interesting game. Um, South have got all sorts of issues, right? So the good thing is South have got to win because you don't want to play South if they're like 0-6 and 6 because yeah, that's just not a fun time to play them. Um, but the good thing is now that they've got a win, uh, who have South got this week? They've got the Warriors. The Warriors, yeah. Yeah, at home as well. So, um, And they weren't, time they weren't particularly them. good against the Bulldogs. Like, they were fine, but they were not anything more than that. Yeah, and the thing about them is they have a lot of good players and they can, if they can work out the tweaking, they can get it yeah. right. They'll, they'll be yeah. a good team. A lot of people had them in their top four coming into this season. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of personalities there that a lot of egos and a lot of you know, different styles of football that they're trying to play all at the same time. So they'll work it out eventually. Um, mm. But that's a danger game for us. Um, so yeah, again, it's... getting Nakora, hopefully Royce Hunt as well. Uh, maybe Finucane might even be back by then. I'm not sure. It's, uh, uh, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, actually, no, he's, he's got a fractured face, doesn't he? I think he'll be at least a month. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you've got uh, the home game uh, versus the Cowboys. So maybe we can try and see if we get uh, one of those Quest hotel rooms for that game. <laughs> yeah, you did have your eye on those, don't, didn't you? It was, uh, the people on the balcony, shout out, out to you. Yeah. Tell us how much that cost. Yeah, well, I'm sure we could inquire ourselves, but it looked like fun. You don't want to you don't want to fill that balcony too much, though, but it looked like fun. There was one guy standing on a railing at one point that had me quite nervous. So definitely don't do that, people. Yeah. All right, Kieran, we better get out of here because my coffee's getting a little bit cold, even in this great thermos mug. But um, hey, thanks for your time and thanks for hanging out yesterday. And we will no doubt talk to you again in the near future, as soon as we can, of course. Thank you. And for hope you have a good week. Future, no I'm going to make sure that my daughters are nowhere near my office when we do we this because today them. they've just okay. gone absolutely bonkers today. So sorry about that, everyone, if you heard them no. before or my wife trying to vacuum. Um, hey, they got to live their life. It's, it's all good. It's not all about us. It should be about me more, I think. Well, <laughs> well you, you, you have that nice argument today with your beautiful wife, all right? <laughs> we will talk to you soon. Thank and, you very much. Uh, just remember, wrestling is real. People are fake. Cheers. Up, up. See you, my man.